AI is learning patterns of human behavior as well. Humans are chronically hypocritical. We talk peace while we make weapons of war. We talk honesty while we lie to the, our, our constituents. We cheat, we uh, rob, we steal, we're violent. If AI is learning patterns of human behavior without being able to be also taught about the morals and the emotional EQ about what those behaviors mean and which behaviors are acceptable and which behaviors are not, we don't really know how AI will interpret all of that when it comes to completing a task. There's a hubris when we create these technologies that we can control it. We believe, okay, well, we control nuclear energy. Well, we really haven't. It's still a threat. We, but it's the same problem that we saw with tobacco. The tobacco industry denied that there was a problem there. They even had advertisements with babies smoking cigarettes back in the 40s and 50s. I mean, it was seriously that deceptive. Guy, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. It's Thank great so to have you here. I'm really excited to speak with you. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. So you have a very impressive resume. You have multiple degrees in economics, finance, computer science, and also an MBA. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, you have um, 38 years experience, you know, working with Fortune Fortune 500 companies in global energy, high tech, and software. Um, and some of those companies are Oxy Petroleum, IBM, Burroughs, Oracle, Microsoft, and um, a few startups. So you have a wealth of experience. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your interests lie on the leading edge of technology innovation, especially um, around the space of early stage artificial intelligence. Yeah. So I want to start off by asking what got you interested in AI and really developing an expertise in that space? Well, to, well, first off, thank you for having me. It's exciting to have, and this is a topic that I love talking about. It's uh, I use this fluently in my books um, and to talk about. Most people don't realize, but AI is like 70 years old. Um, we've been working on various versions of AI since the 19, the first meeting and discussions of AI started in 1956 at a conference in Dartmouth. Um, I began, I, my interest in AI, I was always working on leading edge technologies, bringing those technologies into either governments or business. And that was just my career just seemed to lean in that direction because I was always good at saying how I, how I could use a technology to change how the business worked. And I was good at figuring out how to integrate the technology into how we basically ran the business anyway, because there's always a shift. There's always a change. And Toward the end of my career, that's what I did with Microsoft, was I was I led their services group to go out and lead the implementation of large complex deals with our latest technology, and then to actually how to sell those deals well. So in the 90s, actually, during one of my, my jobs, I implemented an early stage of artificial intelligence. It was that we actually didn't call it artificial intelligence back then. The term at the time was uh, expert systems. And it was a form of artificial intelligence that's been continuing to grow. And we still use expert systems today, uh, but we've added to that other forms of AI. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but that was really what got me started. But the other in incident that really got me passionate about doing it and writing about it was when I accidentally discovered that a program had escaped the Lawrence Livermore Labs at Sandia, which is an NSA spy lab. It's the same laboratory that developed the famous Stuxnet virus, which was a the most complicated malware ever created. It wandered the internet for years until it found a specific location where it could identify specific types of devices with specific serial numbers. And then it kicked in and destroyed the Iranian centrifuge sites and basically set the Iranian nuclear program back over a decade. And so this same laboratory, a program had escaped that same laboratory. I became, a, I, I get this way. I get these little bugs in my head, my, this little ear bug, and I can't get rid of it. I just, I have to solve the problem. And so I spent close to a year on and off with my job. I cut this little article out 
and it was an Associated Press article, so I felt it had some legitimacy. And I was determined to figure out how could a program escape the NSA, and why would the NSA design it that way that it could do have that capability. And when I had figured those two things out, I started a webisode series about this this rogue NSA spy program, and the FBI sent two agents to my door. So they were they were a very perturbed that I had figured out something they thought was supposed to be top secret. Um, what bothered them even more than me knowing about it and then publishing publicizing it uh, in my 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 webisode series was my snarky attitude. Because while they were very upset, in my mind, when they showed up, it validated my research. It basically, and I, and I told them, I was laughing, I was giddy. I was, I mean, this is so great. I'm so glad you guys are here. Oh, come on, boys, give it up. You wouldn't be here if I was wrong. I can't wait to tell all my friends. It, it wasn't the response they were looking for. And, and, and so after they gave me the we are not amused speech, my wife came home and I had to explain to her why there were two FBI agents in our dining room. And I got the what did I do speech. And that night, I remember thinking, I have got to put this in a book or a movie or something. This is this is just too fun, too, too cool for for let go. And that began me really thinking about AI, not just in how technologies could be used, cyber technologies, malicious software, networking, cloud computing, um, phones, devices, satellites. What I wanted to do is start to think in terms of, well, wait a minute, rather than thinking in terms of like a business person, how would I use this in business? How would I be using this if I were a spy? If I were the government, if I wanted to create a an espionage tool, if I wanted to create a cyber weapon, if I wanted to create an artificial intelligence weapon, what are the kinds of things I would be doing if I did that? And that was really what kind of led me into the current place I'm at. You said something fascinating at the beginning that AI is 70 years old. I didn't know that. I thought maybe 20 years old, but this has been in the works for some time. And I know that you talked briefly about how powerful it is based on your experience with the NSA, but for those who are listening, if you can make this as simple as possible, what exactly is artificial intelligence and right. just right. how powerful is it? Um, well, let's start with what it is. So for many years, I used to, we used to call computers really fast, dumb machines. And the reason we said that is that in order for a computer to do anything, a, a developer, somebody who can write code has to sit down and describe for the computer exactly what it's going to do, how it's going to do it, and what the output is going to look like. The computer could do nothing on its own. Um, it couldn't modify the, 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 the information in any way unless that's exactly what the developer said it would be. And so it was really easy to test the outcome because we could just take the income, the input process or input data, test the processes and make sure it lined up with what we got on the other end. With artificial intelligence, what we've been trying to do is teach the computer how to process information the way we do and teach the computer how to think on its own. Now, that's a really big order of magnitude. And so we've taken it in very small chunks. The first failure that we had was trying to think that we could create general intelligence, that we could create an intelligence that was like ours. And what we found is that that was too big of a task. We've, we had to then break down uh, artificial intelligence. We had to break it down to little minor, really narrow niches. Like, okay, let's just teach the computer how to look at MRI scans and detect the cancer cell. It can do nothing else. It can't talk. It can't speak. It can't reason. It can't rationale. It's only trained to do one little tiny thing. And we've been able to do that really well. And we have that are better than humans at um, doing those specific tasks. We're now getting to the point where we're starting to, the big change came about 2018-ish, 17, 18, when we started to um, create machines that were um, what we call multi multimodality. But by modality, what we simply mean is the, is the data type. 
So text is a data type, speech is a data type, image is a data type, movie is a data type, um, DNA could be a data type. And so we started teaching the computers how to not just identify the tail of a cat in an image, but what is a cat? define how it would sound to talk about how to take care of a cat bring in the language and the poetry and the other other elements about a cat and to bring all of these simple modalities together so that we have the the intelligence has context which is a real important factor for humans to have context we first start learning by saying okay this is red and this is blue okay this is a red ball and this is a blue box and so we start learning those very narrow things first, and then we start to combine them together. And that's really the path we've been on with artificial intelligence. So the current artificial intelligence, something we call machine learning or deep learning, and those are two different things. Machine learning is where we're taking millions and millions and millions of data points, and we're training the machine to say, detect the cat image in these images. And when it gets it wrong, we correct it. We actually have people correcting the machines and training it. We do train these machines. No, that's wrong. That's a dog. And then we keep training it until it gets it right. And so there's a machine learning process until the machine can go through and start to basically train itself to some extent and say, okay, this is a dog, this is a cat, that's a lion, that's a giraffe. Um, well, now that we've started to um, teach the machine how to do small things, identify small things on their own, we're now teaching them to start identify other types of things, how to learn in other ways. And one of those ways is called deep learning. And the key, a key event that happened in, in the industry with this was with Google. Now, uh, years ago, IBM created a machine and at artificial intelligence called Big Blue. And Big Blue was a big mainframe computer and only had one job, which was to beat the world's champion chess player at chess. And it, we trained it on all of the different moves and strategies that the best chess players play. So it could recognize those patterns as the other person was playing it and be able to beat them. And it took a few tries, but they actually got it so that this big giant mainframe could, can, could beat the world's champion chess player. Well, they said, well, there's a Chinese game called Go that's way more complicated than chess has um, multiple times more types of moves and strategies. And, and so we wanted to do the same thing. And Google decided to train a, an AI using the strategies of the world's champion Go Master. And it took them about a year to train the AI using machine intelligence or machine learning with these strategies and these rules, uh, which is sort of a form of expert system um, to beat that master. And then they said, well, what if we took another AI and we just gave it the rules of the game and the goal to win and we let it teach itself everything else? And what happens is we, we and this works in certain parameters, it doesn't work in others, but where we allow the computer to basically run simulations to try and fail millions and millions and millions of times until it figures out how to get it right. Well, within one month, this computer just running its own simulations had taught itself all of the strategies and winning strategies, including some that nobody had ever conceived of in the past. And it was able to beat this other AI that could beat the world champion every single time. And that's what we call deep learning, where we're allowing the machine to actually learn the rules and go outside of the, 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 the box and, and break the rules and fail and simulate it millions and millions and millions of times until they come up with strategies that get it right better than we do. And that's called machine learning. Now, so when we talk about what is an AI, an AI is a machine that's taught to recognize patterns in data and learn how to achieve a certain task or goal. And to do it so many times, so many millions of times that it learns how to do it better than we can. That makes sense? That makes a lot of sense. And so many questions are popping into my head, but I'm going to try to streamline my thoughts as best as I can. Yeah. So from my understanding, it doesn't seem like all AI are the same. Because I think 
something Bingo. that a lot of people are familiar with, for example, is chat GBT, right? Mm -hmm. Chat GBT. And there's literally AI in everything. I mean, I Googled something the other day and the Google results came out and then it had an AI response before that as well. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are familiar with chat GBT or search engines that also use AI to like give them questions to their um, answers to their questions, for example. Right, right. And then now you're talking about really, really powerful machines that are able to iterate and learn themselves mm -hmm. without a human being necessarily programming them a certain way. They can kind of evolve almost they can kind of evolve almost is that correct yeah, self-developmental yeah and, and and that's true and that there's some there that creates some risks and fears and that's one of the reasons why um last year uh, an mit professor named max tegmark issued a open letter basically asking all ai labs to pause development so that they could get a handle on as a community on how to put guardrails on how we develop and use and implement and regulate these technologies. Well, it failed. Not a single lab on the planet basically complied and because there's so much money and competition involved that none of them wanted to lose any time to the other. Um, but there's real risks involved. And let's break that down a little bit. So first thing you mentioned was that there's different types of AI. And that's really important to understand because some forms of AI are completely beneficial with very little risks um, that we can't handle um, we don't already know how to handle. And so it's important to know that when people talk about AI, there's not just one megalithic, monolithic AI that's like uh, um, uh, Lucy in the iRobot that's going to take over the world and control all the robots and everything else. We're, we're not there. There's actually, I have a list of well over 500 AI applications on the market today trying to find an audience. And there's probably another at least two or three times that many um, um, products in the laboratory being developed as we speak. Um, AI investments have have now um, exceeded $200 billion in the last three to four years. And investors are going to want something back for those, that investment. So there's multiple types of AI. The most common type of AI and those AIs can go through multiple developmental stages. So let's talk about the most common type of AI, which is what we call narrow intelligence, which is what we've already talked about. Great example is an AI that can only read a cancer cell in a CAT scan, it can't do anything else. Another um, version of AI that's narrow is an AI that can do uh, speech to text. Uh, recognize speech patterns, uh, recognize accents, people's different voices and, and pronunciations, and recognize speech and translate it to text. It's all it can do. It can't do anything else. It can just recognize voice patterns and translate those into text. That's a narrow intelligence, but it's very powerful. The second area where we get into, and, and, and narrow intelligence can be various forms, like what we, we talked about before, an expert system. And an expert system basically um, works in the way that we take a complex scenario and we go to a bunch of experts and we say, if this, then that. If you get this situation and you get this type of data, what do you do? If you get this type of situation and data, then what do you do? And we create a lot of what if types of models, right, algorithms, and we feed that to the computer so that as it gets information, it's using the experience of an expert to know how to deal with it. Right. So that's one system, but that's still a fairly narrow AI. Uh, we have other AI that are called rules based and which is a similar to a, a, an expert system, which is if this, then that. Right. Um, we um, the next area that we get into is what we call integrated artificial intelligence. And this is where we have a number of narrow intelligence applications that are combined together into a single integrated system to perform a larger, more complicated task. The best example of that is a self-driving car. Imagine all of the things you have to do to drive a car. You have to steer the car. You have to make sure you're steering within the lanes. You have to make sure you're understanding where the streets and the cross streets are. You have to be able to look at a street sign and, and discern that that street sign says stop and that one means slow or merge. Um, you have to be aware of the cars behind you and on the sides and people that things that might be off the road that might be moving in your direction. You have to get a sense for, okay, this car is moving in this direction. There might be a potential collision there. There's 
you got to manage speed and braking. There's all kinds of individual things that we do to drive a car. And every single one of those things is a narrow intelligence. And so one of the reasons that driving a, getting a machine to drive a car is that if any one of those intelligence models breaks, it could affect the entire model, right? Um, it could create, and it could have a lethal um, consequence. Somebody could die. And so complex or integrated artificial intelligence is, uh, where, is, is where we basically pull in many of these. And, and our weapon systems are, look like that. Many of our infrastructure systems are integrated systems. Many of our uh, cyber security and cyber defense and national defense AIs are integrated systems. And so these are all, um, and so there's a complexity. The risk in an integrated system is one of the individual AI models will, will break down and we have to kind of debug where it's breaking down mm -hmm. to come up with a, that crash result. And it creates more complexity for error and for hacking. Right, for someone to do something malicious. Um, but we're getting really good at creating these, these integrated systems, and those are coming along really well. Now, large language models, you talk about GPT, and that's the AI that people are most familiar with. That's the product that got AI into the consciousness of the general consumer. Those of us have been in the industry, I released my first book, Swarm, in 2020, and it was already talking about many of these things that didn't come out with GPT until 2022 and after and, and more. And so how it's, AI is being used in weapon systems, espionage, cybersecurity, et cetera. <clears throat> and so there's many types of AI. Now, where we're going with AI, the one that has most people most interested is large language models. Now, and, and generative AI, and generative AI has to do with creative things like generating music, sound, voices, videos, images, and those, again, are using patterns. So one of the ways that AI learns is by vast, vast amounts of patterns. So ChatGPT, for example, has something like um, 100 billion data tokens. Um, we're moving towards trillions of data tokens in the next versions. And by the end of the decade, we'll be into the hundreds of trillions. I mean, vast, almost unfathomable amounts of information. Now, GPT-4, that's the model that's starting to get people concerned. But right now, it's very smart. So, for example, GPT-4 has an IQ tested of about 155. That's smarter than 99% of the people on the planet. That's only five points less than an Einstein. That's pretty doggone smart. But it's not smart enough. And here's why. AI has an, uh, a problem where we call it hallucinations, where AI large language models are the ones that have these the most, where it sounds really good. It's really well articulated. The grammar is perfect. It sounds really credible, except it might be making up the facts completely out of the blue. And unless you're editing this, unless you're an expert and you're reading this and you and you know that the name that it gave for that national defense program is a completely fictitious name, most people won't know. And so there's a there's a potential to for AI to be very misleading if it's hallucinating and creating facts on the fly. So that's we can correct that with more training. That's really much more of a training issue and an integration issue into more tighter databases that other than language models that deal with some of these larger data issues. It's a pain, it's dangerous, it's got potential problems. It could be, it, it's, if you're writing a marketing blurb and you're gonna edit it afterwards, probably no problem. If you're trying to do a financial statement and you're not careful, that could be a problem. So depending upon what you're using it for, there's risks there, but it's not the end of the world. Now, the area of intelligence where we're going to get to, and this is where people are, why 30,000 AI experts, policymakers, and executives signed the open letter from Max Tegmark. 30,000 people signed that letter. The reason they're concerned is how fast the industry is moving and where the direction is going. And that's where I think we have the most concerns. So it's interesting, right? Because this technology is so powerful. And yes. for someone like me listening to it, 
I could easily be like, oh, well, there's so many possibilities here with such powerful technology. But a lot of times when you hear people talk about it, it sounds like, hey, we need to be worried about this. This could go really, really bad for us. And I want to read a couple of quotes um, from a couple of people in this space like yourself. So um, from Elon Musk, for example, he said, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. And nobody would suggest we allow the world to just build nuclear warheads if they want that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. And mm-hmm. then we have um, someone else who, um, he, Mo Gaudat, he's yeah, an ex-Google officer. Mm-hmm. He said, AI is worse than nuclear bombs, kind of alluding to what Elon said as well. And then it makes me think about a couple of things. Why create this? Was it intended to go this far? And are there any sort of regulations to make sure that it does not get get out of hand? Like, are we really powerless in this situation? Uh, I'm going to give that as a qualified yes and no. Um, are, is there a danger? Absolutely. So we're currently at GPT-4, which has an IQ of 155. The AI models, have, as we've been building these massive, larger and larger data sets, have been growing in intelligence roughly about tenfold with every new version. So we're currently at 155. We're at a genius level with ChatGPT4. ChatGPT5 will come out in 2024 sometime. And so we're expecting a roughly tenfold increase in the intelligence. And more importantly, GPT-5 is going to start to become multimodality, right? So in other words, it can, rather than dealing only with text, it can now deal with images and videos and other types of data and speech. And so we're now seeing actually GPT this week uh, or uh, chat or open AI this week announced a new version of GPT-4 that would create a, um, visual interaction with a G with a uh, with an AI that has a voice modulation that could actually be like a companion, a a a, a helpmate, to someone to talk to, a a, a counselor, a, a flirtatious individual. It's like the movie Her um, has finally has actually hit the, the 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 commercial product line now, and but the next version of GPT. So we're now dealing with ten times more. We could be dealing with a super intelligence smarter than anybody on the planet. Now, right now, AI is what we call procedural, which means that it doesn't necessarily have a mind of its own. And there's a caveat to that with emergent properties, and we'll come to back to that in a minute. It it doesn't, AI, open AI products will respond to a prompt by a human individual. It takes a human to say, solve this problem, create this content, write this blurb. It's responding to a human need, but it's not out there with this intelligence deciding that it wants, that it has a will of its own and it, it's got a goal of taking over the world. It's not conscious in that sense. It doesn't have its own will. We are working with some technologies that potentially and with high probability could create a conscious AI. So we're, we're now going to be dealing with, within the next few years, the potential of a superintelligence and a superintelligence that could actually be problematic for us. So uh, if we had a superintelligence and we wanted to unplug it, uh, if it were smart enough, it could deceive, it could understand that and decide to migrate itself someplace else or extort us by saying, sure, you can unplug me, but I'm going to basically shut down your power grid if you do. So we're, we're dealing with a potential of we're, we're no longer for the millions of years we've been on the planet. We've been the smartest thing on the planet. That's no longer going to be true. And we really don't know what we're going to do with it. So I, I liken it to the Jurassic Park moment, the, the contact where we have technology. But when we combine powerful technology with pride, greed, hubris and power, lust for power, we can come up with some bad things. And so for me, the key danger is not the technology itself. It's not evil or benign in itself. And again, I want to come back to that in just a minute. But it's really, I think, the greater danger, and I think Elon Musk alludes to this, is the proliferation danger. Right now, we have no good 
international treaties or laws to prohibit the use, development, safety, testing, proliferation of AI technologies. If I can create an AI technology that could spoof a nuclear missile attack to create a launch, I could I could do that. I could create an AI that could deceive multiple people. If I've got deep fake technology, I could basically change the outcome of an election. So we're now dealing with a super powerful technology and there's no controls. And when we talk about AI learning languages, one of the languages that's learned is how to code. So we've never had an atomic bomb that could turn around and create another atomic bomb. We now have a technology that can turn around and create an, a replica of itself. Remember in the term in Jurassic Park when the, the, the weird professor played by Goldsmith said, life finds a way. Well, I liken that to artificial intelligence. Yeah, life will find a way. And if we give this, this intelligence enough capability to mimic and, min and mimic what we do, if we're smart enough to create an artificial intelligence and it becomes as smart as we are, there's nothing stopping it from creating an artificial intelligence. And that was that's the that's the link that we don't know. There, there's a CEO of a company called an AI company called Stability AI. His name is Edmund Mustache. Really smart guy. They they produce education software. Not really a dangerous type of AI software at all, right? You you think that there's a lot of benefits in that, but because of all these other things, when we if we start saying, well, what happens when AI gets to be super intelligent? What happens when it becomes conscious? What happens when it starts to reproduce? What happens when it creates a gets a will of its own? He says, we really don't know what's going to happen. It's like the event horizon. He likens it to the event horizon of a black hole, the point at which it becomes impossible to predict the future. He believes we're only three years away from that event horizon. That's wow. how fast the technology is moving. And so when we deal with this, we have to deal with this in terms of, it's not just what the technology is doing, but what would a cartel lord, crime lord, dictator, despot, greedy a corrupt ceo greedy corrupt politician or a sociopathic billionaire and we all could probably name at least one what would they do with this technology to increase their own wealth and power to the adverse effect to society and humanity that's something we really don't have control over at this point we also don't have control over some of the crime elements we're going to see an increase a rapid increase in ai related crime with GPT-4, this platform that created Open uh, G, um, Chat GPT, other products were sold on the dark web with that with those same powerful capabilities. There were products called Dark GPT, Evil GPT, Worm GPT, Dark Bird. These are all applications specifically designed to write malicious code using artificial intelligence. And so as they, the artificial intelligence learns to get better and better and better and better at writing malicious code, it's going to get easier and faster for these criminals to write that code and to get it out faster. So we do have some major problems ahead of us, and we're lagging. So last night, the set, uh, Chuck Schumer in the Senate announced that he's produced a 31-page framework for developing legislation around AI. But when he was asked about some of the things that they were looking at, they're mainly looking at some of the commercial elements, things like how to make sure that a product is safe for people to use, make sure that it doesn't have inherent biases uh, towards certain ethnic or, or racial groups, to make sure that um, it doesn't, it can't talk you into leaving your wife, um, right? Like one AI tried to do a couple months ago. Another AI taught was on that was put on um, Snapchat, ge geared towards preteen users, actually tried to convince a 13 year old girl that she should go and spend a weekend with this older man who was flirting with her online because it, it was just trying to be a helpful friend, but it didn't have the moral or any of the other ethical boundaries that we would think that we would need in order to protect that behavior. And so this gets into one of my key issues, which is we're training what I call an alpha male AI system. 
um, by, I don't mean misogynistic and I don't mean toxic masculinity, but what I do mean is that the typical male oriented, business oriented, sports oriented, be faster, be better, be win more, um, those, those types of goal orientations are being built into them all of these various sets of AI. And we're teaching AI how to be a good friend, how to talk like it's really being empathetic. But we're not training it on true emotional intelligence. We're not training them on true empathy, true um, mercy, kindness, uh, politeness. Um, we don't train them on what, what the laws are, what the social norms are, what the legalities issues are, what the moral implications of getting a 13-year-old girl to go out with an older guy is. So we're not training them on the emotional intelligence that humanity has developed over millions of years that help us function as a society. So it's not that the AI will do something bad. It just may not know that it's bad when it does something. Now, this gets into another issue that I alluded to earlier, which is AI are getting better at doing things. They're training themselves. They're learning themselves on getting better at tasks. We've also discovered by accident that AI are also teaching themselves things that we never envisioned they would have to learn. We never thought that they would teach themselves something or have to learn something to complete their task. They're going outside of that task box because they're being taught to learn. And just like anybody who's taught to learn, you want to learn more, you know, right? There's, the, there's a hunger that goes along with that learning process. And so we have, they're called emergent properties. And this is when an AI teaches itself to do something or it teaches itself information and we learn about how it did it by accident. We didn't, we didn't plan it. An example, one example is, that I think is really interesting is an AI that taught itself how to use research level chemistry. It wasn't doing a lab level chemistry work, but I can't remember exactly what, it was sort of this really obscure connection, but it decided that in order to do this other thing over here, it needed to learn research level chemistry. Well, okay, well now it really has the knowledge to create a bomb. Um, uh, if it really wanted to, or a virus or a disease, right? So, and these are some of the worries that we have AIs doing things that are malicious, but not even knowing that they're malicious. Another AI that was being trained to read cancer cells in an MRI scan actually taught itself how to read the person's mind. So it could tell that the person that while it was, um, they were doing the CAT scan, they tested it and realized that they were having the person was looking at an image of a giraffe and they asked the AI to say, well, what is the person thinking? And it drew a picture of a giraffe. Um, another one said had a picture of a or a, a video of a woman falling backwards and laughing at herself or something. And the AI description says, I'm watching a woman falling backwards and laughing at herself. And so it could read the mind of the person based on the MIR scan, only being trained initially to look for cancer cells. It was looking for patterns, and this is a really important thing for us to understand about AI. AI learns by learning patterns. That's how language works. One word almost always follows another word by, by probability. So you get this when you go into your Google search now. You start to type in something, and it fills in the, the sentence saying, you mean this, right? Because more often than not, those are the words, as you start to string those words together, it kind of says, well, this is what we think you mean right, based on these patterns. Well, AI is learning patterns of human behavior as well. Humans are chronically hypocritical. We talk peace while we make weapons of war. We talk honesty while we lie to the, our, our constituents. We cheat, we uh, rob, we steal, we're violent. If AI is learning patterns of human behavior without being able to be also taught about the morals and the emotional EQ about what those behaviors mean and which behaviors are acceptable and which behaviors are not, we don't really know how AI will interpret all of that when it comes to completing a task. Let's say the task is optimize the power grid. Unless we teach it specifically to say you can optimize the power grid, but you can't turn off the power to this poor neighborhood in order to optimize the power source to the industrial sector. An AI 
potentially, if its goal is ultimately to optimize the power grid to produce the maximum amount of economic prosperity, it might cut off the poor neighborhood to feed the fam the manufacturing facility. We don't know. And so there's a lot of unknowns. And so AI is, I, I'm actually very positive with AI. I, I love this technology, very powerful technology, has the potential of doing a number of amazing things, um, come up in, coming up with new uh, treatments for, for medical disease, coming up with new materials, uh, using uh, actually creating new molecular structures, uh, solving some extremely complex problems that we've been unable to resolve because of the vast amounts of data involved. Uh, we now have AI building climate models that are actually being telling us that our previous models were too optimistic. Um, so we have AI doing a lot of positive things. And earlier on, you asked, why are we doing this if there's so much danger? I'll give it to you straight. Um, money, power. The PricewaterhouseCoopers has predicted that AI will add as much as $15 trillion to the global economy by 2030. The International Monetary Fund and has said that, that the result in order to get to that 15 trillion, as many as 40%, as much as 40% of the global workforce will be displaced by AI because AI having an AI that can work 24 seven and never complain, never ask for a raise, don't ask for benefits, don't want weeks off, doesn't need a vacation, um, is gonna be cheaper for corporations to produce content, to produce products than hiring people. And so you'll get this really incredible vast amount of wealth growth that will go directly to the top 1% because 40% of the middle class is being um, displaced. Uh, Goldman Sachs thinks has put a number on that and said that's as much as 300 to 500 million jobs be by 2030 that could be displaced. The economic disruption that will come from that, the level of unemployment, the level of uh, people losing their homes, the level of people having to cancel school and going to sending their kids to college, the number, and unlike previous industrial revolutions that hit mainly lower class, working class, uh, low skilled labor, AI is going to affect management, technicians, engineers, architects, managers, designers, filmmakers, uh, creative types. It, it's going to basically annihilate. It's going to have a huge clash on the middle class. Governments get roughly 50 to 60 percent of their tax revenues from that middle class. So as the tax revenues plummet from that, and if we're not offsetting it by taxing these AI systems and the wealthy, the wealthy class, which they basically purchased the lobbyists to get themselves from having to pay tax, we're going to have some serious government deficit issues in a short period of time. And that's going to have ramifications in terms of where we have our priorities. So the reason we're doing this is really it, it's all about, um, you know, they, they have the old saying that um, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Think of AI as the absolutely most powerful short-term power shift that we've ever seen in our history, um, going from the middle class to the wealthy. And that's what that's why we're doing it. Is, and that's why they didn't stop when they had the chance to stop and try and talk together about regulations is because I can't stop because I can't trust that the Chinese won't keep going or I can't trust that the other company won't keep developing. I don't want to lose my place. It's too competitive. There's too much money to be made at this trillions of dollars. And I'm not going to slow down for anybody for any purpose unless I'm it's absolutely positively necessary or unless it's only to save me from legal liabilities. Um, they're only going to pause and correct things that are going to create marketing and commercial problems for them, legal liabilities, but they're not going to stop in terms of general development because there's a, a hubris. There's a hubris when we create these technologies that we can control it. We believe, okay, well, we controlled nuclear energy. Well, we really haven't. It's still a threat. We, but it's the same problem that we saw with tobacco. The tobacco industry denied that there was a problem there. They even had advertisements with babies smoking cigarettes back in the 40s and 50s. I mean, it was seriously that deceptive. Uh, the oil industry, I was actually part of an oil, you, you mentioned earlier, I was with an oil company. I was with Oxy Petroleum in the boardroom on the day when we presented in the early 90s 
early studies that we had created ourselves that talked about climate change issues, talked about the uh, re decrease of North Sea ice, ice because of CO2 emissions. And I was there when the C, when the chairman of the board went into a red face spittle tirade and threatened to fire anybody that brought this up again. Why? Because this does not sell oil. Our shareholders hire us to sell oil. And because we sell oil, we're going to kill this information. And it was our study. <laughs> it was the report that we had created. It wasn't somebody else that we could say, oh, that they were they're working for the liberals or something like that. Th this was our report from our own scientists. And within three months, the scientists that wrote that report were fired. Um, and nobody was ever, we, we never were allowed to bring that topic up again. So it's the same in, in when social media. We Everyone warned about early on about the potential dangers of social media. Oh, no, there's nothing wrong here. It's just the, um, the community, you know, um, time to share what everyone thinks. Well, we now know that there are serious emotional, social, and, and uh, political issues and, and divisions in the country made worse by social media. AI is the same way. Like Elon Musk is an ironic. Elon Musk once said that uh, AI is summoning the demon. Then he goes out and he builds AI and he wants you to buy his AI because it's as long as it's the demon that he's going to make money from, it's not that it's a demon. He just wants to make sure you're not buying the other guy's demon. Um, and so it's less about the, so Elon's warnings are really hollow because it's less about warning of the technology and it's more about his own personal motivation of what piece of this is he going to get. And so we're in that, that there is a danger here. We're in the danger because right now the money motive is so incredibly powerful and the regulations to contain this are really slow to catch up. The European Union was the first union. They were the first ones to pass an overall AI Act in 2023. Um, oh, no, it was late, early 2024. But their AI Act was only dealing with, again, some of these more commercial issues, such as rights management. Um, you can't go out and take somebody's novel and make it part of your database without compensating them somehow or getting their permission you we it's uh you can't release a product that has an obvious bias towards a, a specific gender or ethnic group um you can't do models that's you know you have you we don't want to have models that can be released to criminals to modify they have to be restricted in certain ways so they're doing prime they're really focused on right now the commercial aspects and concerns, but they're not really targeting the larger aspects and concerns of how do we manage super intelligence? How do we manage consciousness? How do we manage weapons development, lethal weapons development? Now that jumps into, and stop me if I'm going too long here. There's a treaty that was released about four years ago called LAWS, and LAWS stands for Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems. And the treaty basically said, it's okay to use uh, AI to make your weapon more accurate, to make it operate better, to make it more efficient, to make it integrated with your other systems, to make it more intelligent. But we have to draw the line and say we should not have weapons that are that can kill somebody unless a human is involved in making that trigger decision. Of the 140 countries that signed the Laws Treaty, the United States. China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and Israel, which means these are the countries with the most active weapons development programs. And all of them have basically said that they refuse to sign a treaty that prevents them from creating weapons that have lethal autonomous capability. And so my book, Swarm, actually deals with one of those weapon systems. Um, and I can't remember the technical name or the, the, the test name for it, but it's a DARPA system that's being trained in the Nevada desert right now. And it deals with connecting. And we've seen, we've seen these um, Chinese and other displays, like fireworks displays of getting a thousand drones basically coordinating in, in the skies in this glorious lit up dance, right? So you get it changing into a dragon and then changing into a circle. And so we're, it's basically drones coordinating with each other. Well, the, the militaries decided that they could do that and they could weaponize these drones and then create attack maneuvers so that they could send the 1,000 or 10,000 drones into a remote village 
and sort out the the combatants in the village be as opposed to bombing the village until it doesn't exist anymore. So the idea is, and, and it's a good idea in that sense, is that rather than destroying the whole infrastructure of a town, all we want is to go find all the combatants and to take those out. And so we should be able to train the AI on how to recognize that somebody's holding a weapon, what type of weapon, are they dressed in a uniform, what type of uniform. You know, we should be able to train these AI to basically fly in formation and basically sort out, clean out this town. Can you imagine? It'd be like having 10, 1,000 drones or 100 drones. Imagine being attacked by wasps and you're attacked by a swarm of wasps and they're behind you and they're underneath you and they're coming from all directions and you can shoot and you can swat and you can but it's undefensible right uh, and so that's what they're they're creating and so we don't know what china's doing we know that they well we do know some of what china's doing but every one of these countries are actually working on various forms of lethal autonomous ai weapon systems there's so much here and the biggest thing that keeps jumping out at me is just this deep desire for power and money, but to what end if it's disrupting society? If the people in power <laughs> are so worried about control and making trillions of dollars or whatever currency, but you're displacing the, the rest of the population, the people you're supposed to be governing, then what is the point of that? Um, someone said, Vladimir Putin actually said, whoever becomes a leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. Um, and President um, Xi in China has also said the same thing. And he's basically has declared that it's China's goal to become the, the dominant AI producer in the world. Now, one of the ways that she's going to achieve that goal, and most people don't realize this, is through Taiwan. Taiwan produces 93% of the advanced microchips necessary to do run our military, run our AI systems, our advanced technology systems, our surveillance systems, our military systems, uh, cars, appliances, uh, all of the AI and all of the devices that are come out, phones, all of these things require these advanced microchips that are produced almost exclusively in Taiwan. Now we've signed some that we've done some infrastructure deals in the last couple of years where we're, we're working with I, with um, Intel to in Ohio and Texas and a few other places to start building manufacturing facilities here. But those facilities usually take about 10 years to really get online and fully up and running. China has announced that their goal is to take over Taiwan, whether it's by invasion or some other way by 2027. Again, three years away. If China is, succeeds in taking over Taiwan, it would cripple the global, it would cripple our ability to produce competitive AI, competitive military, competitive technologies for a decade. And so Russia is trying to be number one on this. China is trying to be number one. China is way far, way ahead of Russia on this front um, and uh, probably is competitive with the United States. And China has currently has a and and but they're using it in different ways. You might have heard of the Chinese citizen system. Um, they basically they use um, cameras and and AI to monitor your phone, to monitor your your browser, to monitor watch you as you go to the store and do everything. Um, and they rate you as how good of a citizen you are, and based on how good of a citizen you are, that determines what kind of bank accounts and services and other things you can get. Um, what many people don't know is that China has already sold portions of that system to as many as 40 countries. So the idea of using this technology to monitor your citizenship is gaining prominence around the world. And it will gain prominence. There's even some in some U.S. cities who have toyed with the idea of using AI to monitor crime. There's actually an AI, uh, you remember the um, minority report with Tom Cruise. There's actually an AI route right now that does predict that can say, well, in this particular neighborhood, there's a there's a X percent probability that this type of crime will occur within this day and that day. Now, they don't know who the criminal is yet. They can't tell that. But they're really just running statistics of past behaviors and things. Um, so it's not really that incredible, but they're moving in that direction to try and anticipate um, how to control citizens and behavior. So if 
my problem is I'm I'm a his, I've studied history. I've never seen any time in history where people of power have been willingly put that power down for the good of the people. It's always had to be taken from them. And so we're going through a social disruption right now, not only because of AI, but because of social media and how Russia and China are using social media to divide us. So we're seeing a division in America. It used to be we had single source. I remember I grew up with Walter Cronkite. There was one source of facts. People could disagree about what we should do with the facts, but we only had one set of facts at the time. Now there's my facts, your facts, alternative facts. We don't even have an idea, a central idea of what truth is anymore. And so we're, we're going into a stage where we're really at the cusp. At, at, there's a potential of losing our democracy and becoming a three large autocracies on the planet against all of the smaller democracies mm -hmm. on the planet. So we're going through and we're going through demographic changes. So there's been some studies. The baby boomer, the, the post-war era, has seen our population, world population, more than double uh, in 70 short years. And it's still continuing to grow, although it's slowing. Um, but what we and we and for many years we kept thinking, oh, it's population growth. What are we going to do with all these people? Well, now because of it's slowing down, the U.S., Italy, Germany, France, Spain, a number of industrialized countries are no longer producing a birth rate to replenish their population, which means that the natural population is growing. And as all of the baby boomers start to retire, you're going to see a drop off over the next 10 years of the workforce. So you have fewer workers, and but businesses work on the fundamental model of growth. If they're not growing year over year, they're somehow failing, right? So if you're not growing, you're, you're, you're failing. And so in order for them to grow during this stage where people are spending less and working less, um, AI is going to be that ability for them to continue to cr create prosperity for themselves, regardless of what's happening for others. So how can the average person listening to this probably feeling a lot of anxiety, right? Yep. How can they prepare for this technological revolution that's already happening, but that's going to become more intense in the coming years? How That's can they question. make sure that they still have a job, they can make money? Yeah. And mm -hmm. how can they make sure they don't get lost in the, um, what's the what's the right word? Paranoia of being watched or being studied, all of that. Yeah. When the AI, when the FBI came to my house, I knew immediately that I was on the watch list and I would be on the watch list for a number of years. I wasn't breaking any laws. So it's like, I didn't really care. I, they, they could show, I write books about AI. I write books about artificial, about the government and the corruption in government and politics and everything else. Uh, I'm sure that they could pay me another visit. It wouldn't be a big surprise based on the things I research and the things I do. But I don't really care if they're watching me because I'm not really doing anything wrong. That's their problem. They're, they're going to get bored more often than not. Um, the, what I tell people in general, though, is that this is a transition that is going to happen whether we like it or not. The best way for an individual to prepare is to decide is to make career choices. This all gets into personal choices. Um, the personal choices I recommend is that, particularly for someone young like you, now I'm 60, I'm almost 70 years old, I'm an old guy and I'm, I'm writing books and not much that's going to go on is going to affect me directly all that much. Mm -hmm. But if I were young in my career and aggressive like I was, one of the things I would be doing is I would be learning the AI tools that affected my job and my career, and I would get really damn freaking good at them. Now, here's what's going to happen. And we saw this happen when we first started introducing. I was in business. I was in Fortune 500 companies with IBM and then Oxy before we had personal computers on every desktop. Um, that the t There was a time when there was only five computers in the whole company, and they were all on the desks of VP secretaries because the VP didn't want to learn how to use it, and the secretary didn't know how to use it. And so we didn't really know what to do with these really expensive machines until I came along and started showing them what we were going to do with it. Now, what I saw was 
we went from a stage where we had 300 accountants on one floor of a building um, on Wilshire Boulevard. And as we started implementing accounting software, 30 accountants could do the job of 300. And so 270 of those accountants got displaced. The people who stayed were people like myself who weren't afraid of the technology, who were willing to get in and roll up their sleeves and say, okay, I used to have a secretary type everything for me. If I get my computer, one of the things I have to, I have to learn how to do is, oh my God, I got to learn how to type, right? It was fundamental skills. For, so we're at a similar situation with AI. AI will displace people because it will make some people way more productive and we won't need as many. Now, there's two strategies that I can tell businesses to do there. One is train everybody in your business on the AI that implements your business or that implements their job, whether it be marketing or accounting or scheduling or receptionist or consumer service or design or engineering or testing. Find the tools that will help you do that job better and train everybody on it. And you'll have two things. You'll either have some companies who say, well, I only need three people now. We need to get rid of these other people. Be one of those three people. Or you're going to get some smart companies that say, well, if I can do three times as five times as much work per person, I can go after new products. I can go after new customers. I can go after new markets. I can grow my, I can keep the people I have and be dedicated by people, but invest in their training such that every one of them becomes more productive and I can grow my business. So there's opportunities here for those who are willing to embrace this transition. The other thing that we can do as individuals is to vote, right? We can vote those people who are aware, who are less tied to the corporate interests and more tied to the human interests of running our society and are willing to put in place the either the regulations and controls and then the support mechanisms we're going to need um, to increase taxes on the rich as necessary in order to keep our budget deficits in control. So it's a, it's a, it's a political question. Who's going to be leading us that's going to be aware of these dynamics? Right now, there's too many people in, in, in Washington that are bought off by these same big government or big business interest groups, and they're less concerned with the effect on the employees. Um, they will be once the employment goes up, but then they'll be to do the typical political stuff of just pointing fingers at somebody else. So the only way for us to do that is to be informed voters, uh, to be voters. You can't sit on, this is not a time to sit on the sidelines. I encourage everyone to become a voter. I encourage everyone to become a learner. I encourage everyone to become an evangelist uh, because those are the things that are gonna give you the most personal stability during that time. Now, some people are gonna say, well, I've been wanting to change careers anyway. I'm not really happy with my job. Maybe this is the time for me to reprioritize what I value in life. For some people, that's going to be more outdoor activities. Uh, for some people, that's going to mean more spiritual and faith activities, more community, social. It's For some people, it's going to mean giving back and joining a volunteer group and learning how to give back to those who are really suffering the most from these transitions. So there's a there's there's the personal development and empowerment process that goes along with these other things as well. So I studied this. Now, I'm a thriller writer. So it's my job. And, and as the guy who implemented leading edge technologies, one of the most important skill sets I had to develop and get really exceptionally good at was risk management, which is going into any situation saying, okay, let's be honest with ourselves. What can go wrong? How bad could it go wrong? What could we do to keep it from going wrong? And what do we do afterwards when it goes wrong? And doing that kind of risk planning. Well, I'm a thriller writer. My job is to basically say what can go wrong. That's, that's the whole job. That's the whole point of taking these technologies and taking, but putting it into a nice story form, right? Where it's, yeah, everything went wrong, but the characters were so much fun. We, we enjoyed reading the, 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 you know, it was fun to read. So I do tend to see some of these negatives uh, clearer than most because that's what I study. Uh, and that's my training. But I'm a positive guy. I've overcome a great deal in my life. I, most people don't know, but I started off my journey in life as a homeless runaway at age 13. 
I've been able to achieve a number of great things in my life because I was never willing to allow my past or the actions of others to determine my future. And so I encourage everyone to, yes, there are some serious things to be concerned with with this technology. Yes, you'll never get the full truth from the people in, in charge because they have investors to keep happy and they have money they want to make, and that's their primary motivation. And while they will talk about wanting to make sure AI is safe, what they're really saying is they want to make sure it's safe commercially to be free of litigation and, and liability. And so their true motive is to still produce a lot of AI really fast and take over things and fix the social problems as they come up and become a legal liability, but they're not going to really perfect it ahead of time. We're going to be, we're going to be changing the tires as the, as the car is moving mm. on this. And so, yes, there are some things to truly be afraid of. I don't, I think there's, there's some, it'll, it will change society in, in on profound ways in a very short period of time. And I don't think we even know how to anticipate and expect and, and predict all of the things, the, those implications. But we know enough to start being prepared. And yeah. that's what I really encourage people. Start now. Don't delay. Don't procrastinate. You're, you're a, you uh, run a podcast. Get good at the editing tools and the video tools and the planning tools. Uh, get good at the promotional tools. Get you, you Learn to use AI in all of the ways that can help you get more productive and efficient now. Um, and that's part of your survival tool is not to, not to deny when, 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 <laughs> There, there were guys, and when we start, started producing cars, there were guys who produced horse horse buggies that just said, well, people will never want to get rid of their horses. They love their horses. They're clean. They're quiet. No, this is, this is just a trend for the rich. It's never going to take over. And those companies went out of business because they weren't willing to embrace the change. And as an economist, trained as an economist, it's my job to basically look through these larger cycles to say, well, where, where can people put their time and energies? If you're young and you're in school, pick a career that you're going to love, but then either pick a career that's going to be AI safe or pick a career where you're determined that you're going to become one of the AI experts within that career. Mm. And that's just, it just speaks to the magnitude of the technology being able to permeate every single space. Um, but, you know, similar to you, I'm an eternal optimist, and I, I heard a lot of people say that AI is neither good or evil, like you mentioned earlier um, in the podcast. It depends on who's using it, right? And even with the example um, of social media, if we're, we were going to use that as an analogy, there are a lot of things with social media that are very, very troublesome and have affected society in a in a great way way right with people feeling mm -hmm. extremely lonely um a lot of doctored images and facts that you know really can cause i would say um social discourse that can become very that that can spew a lot of hate and discrimination so on and so forth right but there's also a side of social media that is very beautiful where it builds community right and depending on how you consume content your algorithm is going to look so different than people who are consuming a lot of the more um click baby type of content the more harsh negative type of content so i like to think about ai like that in an optimistic way right because we're still living in this world where ai is going to become a thing it is a thing and we would love for the people who are controlling the development of AI to say, wait, let's pause. Maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we're taking it a little too far. Maybe we shouldn't worry about the money, but that's not going to happen. But so because we're going to live in this reality, I do think that if we focus on the positive parts about AI, the way and we picture people who are using it for good and we also use it for good, I think that can foster a lot of hope rather than anxiety for people, even though they are real things that are a cause for concern. But yeah, that's, that's what I want to focus my mind on. But I've also heard people say, you know, AI is the antichrist, right? For those, for some people who are very religious. 
And that's a, that's a yeah. great question. I want to touch on that for a minute because mm -hmm. one of the themes in my books is um, how AI could decode end time prophecy, right? And it's based on, I, I used to build macroeconomic models. Matter of fact, we've, what got me a scholarship into my grad school, got me accepted into Harvard, was I had built a macroeconomic model that outperformed the Federal Reserve uh, and changed how we do build economic models to this day. So I was good at building, I was good at right, building algorithms, taking data, trying to run analysis. And it was a number of years ago. Now, I, I'm a Christian, and I'm not ashamed to say that, but I, I tell people I'm not a Christian like one of the crazy um, white supremacist kind of guys. Those guys are apostate. Um, and I'm not shy in saying that. But I've studied prophecy for a number of years. And I studied, I'm a very logical, rational guy. And and what I would, over, the, over a period of time, I began to hear what I thought of as biases in people's interpretation of prophecy. A lot of people say, oh, it, the Pope is the Antichrist, right? Anything that somebody they don't understand or don't like becomes the Antichrist. And without understanding exactly what scriptures are actually teaching about things. Now, the Pope is, is part of an, a fallen church, and the Bible talks about seven versions of churches in the last days, and five of them are fallen. Five of them are basically corrupt and need repentance and have lost their testimony, their ability to, to show the light to the world. And, and, and we see that today. We see that in the in the white nationalists and the Christian nationalists. We see that in the, the Catholic Church in, in the way that they've and the 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 ethics and the um, sexual abuse and other abuses that they've had over the years, their inquisitions and their violence. And so, but but the Antichrist had certain characteristics that were very prescriptive. So one of the things I did in my model, and it started with a National Geographic article, and it's a little bit of a short story, but I think it's really informative for your audience. The article was, was um, dealing with the loss of fish stocks around the world, in China, Asia, South America, North America, every major fishing grounds around the world. The fishing stocks had been depleted by well over 30%. And it reminded me of a prophecy called the Seven Trumpets, that the allegory of the prophecy and the allegories where much of the biases come in um, said that a flaming rock was going to fall from the sky and land in the ocean. The outcome or the attributes of the prophecy were that a third of the fish of the sea would die, a third of the birds of the air would die, a third of the beasts of the land would die, and two thirds of the rivers of the earth would be so polluted that you couldn't breathe from them. And I put down that article and I thought to myself, I said, well, heck, I, I'm watch the news, I'm pretty sure an asteroid didn't hit the sea, but I do. I, I was involved in environmental studies with the oil company. So I knew that, and uh, I've read books on the sixth extinction, I read environmental studies on loss of species, loss of birds of the air, loss, every single one of those attributes had already occurred. And they didn't occur because of some God event of throwing an asteroid into the sea, they occurred because of the activities of man mankind. And where we're more concerned about profits than we're concerned about the health and well-being of others, including our, our environment. And it started getting me thinking in a different way about prophecy. And I said, first thing that said, well, what if, so instead of the biases of, you know, the Protestants against the Catholics, and it's the left against the right, or the right against the left, and it's America against the, it's uh, Christians against Islam. There are all of these biases that were brought in. But when you look at the scripture, it really doesn't say that at all, right? So these are in overlays. I said, well, what if I could strip away the bias? What if I could get past the allegory? And what if I just created a list of prophecies and their attributes? And what if I could find an event that had a high correlation to those attributes? And or or basically a document or study. If I could find all kinds of environmental studies that already confirm the attributes of that one that one prophecy. And there's over 800 prophecies of the end times. There's more prophecies of the end times than there were the first coming. So what if I could start by collecting the data to see how many of these things I could uh, correlate through attributes? And then what if I calculate that event, the probability of that event, relative to other known human geologic history? So when was the last time, if I take away asteroid and supervolcano, which didn't happen, what was the last time under any circumstance when I saw that kind of um, around the world global, not just regional, but a global uh, decrease in species? Well, it was 
65 million years ago. Well, that means that we've experienced something that has a one in 65 million chance, right? So what if I took, I went to other prophecies, so the creation of Israel. Now, Israel was created. Now, you can hate Israel. You can love Israel. You can agree with the policies, hate their policies. That's irrelevant, right? But a global international body agreed together that they would create this land and that they would invite the people who were dispersed 2000 years ago, who still maintained that cultural identity to go back to that land. That's a singular event in all of human history. It's never happened before for any other people, for any other reason. And we have lots of examples of people being displaced from their lands and still retaining some level of their cultural identity. So that was a one in, Say, let's say that's one in, we have 6,000 years of human history. That's a one in 6,000 probability. So what I did is I started actually building a model and I spent like a really long week. I had a week off and I, my, I was divorced. I didn't have any money and my, my son was over at my wife's house. And this was, again, I get obsessed with these problems. I, and I was, at the time I had access to geolog. I was working with an oil company. I had algorithmic tools to do the probability analysis and the correlation analysis. So I spent a few weeks basically collecting data from a number of sources. I went in, I spent the first day or two inputting data into the database so the data would be there to run the algorithms. And then the second couple of days running up building algorithms. And then I ran the results. And from less than 30 different prophecies, because that's all I had time to do as opposed to the 800, I found data to support to provide high correlation that those had completed, including the one I talked about, the seven trumpets. Uh, the seven seals is another one. Um, and the probabilities came back that it was one in 1.4 trillion against random chance. So in other words, there's 1.4 trillion to one that we had entered into prophetic times. That the, uh, the, the things that we were experiencing in our daily day world that we've experienced since the end of the World War II are all, there's so much correlation to prophecies at such an incredibly remote possibility or probability that those things would occur. Now, some things prophecies talk about, like the moral degradation of society. Well, first off, it's really hard to get valid data of how immoral are we really relative to the Middle Ages, or did we just keep a lot of it under the covers and behind the behind the curtain in the Middle Ages, right? Are we really more promiscuous now than we were then? If we are, I don't know. I don't have the data to say how much more. Um, so we discount it. It's something that has existed throughout history. Uh, we just don't know to what level. Maybe it could be worse now because of pornography and the internet, maybe not. But because there was no data, we didn't account on those things. We only looked at things where we, I, could, I could assign data and attributes, correlations and probabilities to. And that came out, that 1.4 trillion to one was an eye opener for me. It started me thinking about prophecy in different ways. It started thinking about how do I assign attributes to things and, and assign things and understand these things correctly. And one of the mistakes that most people who taught prophecy, I was, their, their, their teachings developed 100 years ago or more, hundreds of thousands of years ago, their doctrine had formed when the events that prophecy was talking about, the situation wasn't set up yet. So they were always speculating as to what it could be. And that became the tradition of how to interpret it. But when you get down to it, it we're having the same problem today that the Pharisees of the first century had. They had, in, they had decided in their mind how the Messiah would show up and become this military leader. And they knew the prophecies, but they had developed this narrative about it that would fit their biases. And because they weren't looking outside of those biases, they completely missed all of the things that happened right under their noses. Well, I blame a lot of pastors for doing the exact same thing. They've been teaching their biases for so long that they're missing the things that are happening right under the nose. So let's go back to your first comment that is AI the beast or the, 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 the Antichrist. First off, the Antichrist, it, there are many Antichrists in the world. And so it formed, It basically defines a set of characteristics. But there is a character that is, that is defined, and there's 10 or more attributes to this character. Lawless, a deceiver, a divider, a destroyer, um, a, um, and I, I'm having a mental block on all, all 10. 
but we can define those attributes and they have to they have to fit somebody. And the other thing is the Antichrist would come from a nation that had a very powerful military, one of the most powerful militaries on the planet, and would um, come from one of the beasts. The, there's two beasts defined in Revelation and two dragons. So the Antichrist would be somebody that would come from one of those two alliances. So, but AI does play into this prophecy, but let me, I'll come back to that. So when we look at the one beast, the one beast had seven heads, 10 crowns, and 10 horns. Well, when I look at attributes, I see an alliance, a powerful, this is an, these are two big, basically political power centers on the earth at the time of this, all this happening. There's two beasts, one of them that I just described. Well, that defines, if I look at it, that's the G7 economies. There's 10 monarchies. There's, most people don't realize this, but there's 10 monarchies that exist within those alliances, right? With between Europe and Japan that still exist. And there's 10 financial centers that basically drive the power of that monarchy that, and, and NATO is the basically undisputed most powerful army on the planet right now. So, and there was another thing that the beast would need to have, the Antichrist would need to have, was the ability to impact um, um, commerce and transactions through the supposed mark of the beast, right? It, to, to impact how people were going to pay for things. Well, in 2023, about three, four, actually 2024, about four months ago, the International Monetary Fund announced that they were going to produce the first ever international bank sponsored currency. And the, at the same time, the World Economic Forum, which is part of the same organization that the uh, World IMF belongs to under the Bilderberg, announced that one of their goals over the next few years is to replace the US dollar for the currency for international trade with this digital currency. And that digital currency, in order for it to operate, will be using an AI platform. So we do see the AI coming into the prophecies, but the beast, the Antichrist, actually is an individual, one of the more powerful leaders, and he's actually in plain sight right now today, uh, if you look at the attributes. And I try to point them out in my books without naming names, but just to get people to think about that. Um, the AI, though, there's a one of the prophecies that deals with all of this says that one that the they will bring they will breathe life into an image of the beast. So take that financial, social, cultural, religious, political, military, banking, um, information, media, all of the things that define modern city is reflected where on this thing we've created that we can't really control well, called the internet. And we've now given it a voice, which we've said that the prophecy said it would be given a voice. That voice is coming through AI. Now, at some point, that voice, that image, that beast, that image of the beast with a voice will be given power over finances. And this is what's going to happen when the IMF and the digital currencies start to take over, um, when we start seeing central banks using replacing monetary cash with digital cash. And one of the reasons they'll want to do that is because then gives them much more control. I can now transfer money all overseas rather than taking days. I can do it in a matter of seconds. I can get blockchain security over the transaction, but now I can use um, AI and quantum security over the whole system. And it becomes a way of then saying, well, if I suspect somebody is a criminal doing criminal activities because it's digital, can't currency, I can cut them off, right? Um, just like 10 years ago, Greece had a financial meltdown with their deficit. And the bow the banks came in, the international banks came in and they said, okay, Greece, we're going to, you're gonna have to do this. You're gonna have to raise your taxes. You're gonna have to cut your spending. And we're gonna basically go into the bank accounts of every single business and person in Greece. And we're gonna take money out to help pay for your debt. And that's what they did. Every single um, citizen in Greece woke up one morning and had roughly a third of their bank account basically depleted in order to pay for the national debt. Digital currency and international digital currency would give that power to the international banks in a much more powerful way. So when we see all of the systems, it's, it's a misinterpretation to call AI the Antichrist. Um, the Antichrist is an individual. He's lawless. Um, he's a deceiver. He's a um, destructive, he's a destroyer, 
he's a would considers himself as a replacement for God or as equal to God. Um, he has the ability to impact financial decisions um, through his power and military decisions and military weapon. Um, he will be one who calls for a peace deal in Israel that would try and create peace in, in, in the Middle East. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other things that he does that, that haven't occurred yet, but I believe I know the individual. And this is the person that everyone says 666 about, and, and that's been a real confusion for everybody else. I have somebody I've, ident I've identified through all the attributes and it's merely, and, and it's, it's mainly by just applying the attributes. And there's only one other person. There's, there's only one person who, who right now, there's two or three people who fits a good majority of the attributes, but there's only one person who fits all of them. And so in my books, when I talk about how AI will decode prophecy, I have the AI basically building those same sort of probability correlation algorithms and regression models that I built years ago and using those same techniques because those are the types of techniques an AI would use in order to understand any, they would use that same sort of mathematical um, approach mm. as opposed to dogma and all of that. Right. And so basically to make sure I fully understand what you're saying, you're saying that the antichrist from your understanding, from your research, um, from you just kind of looking at the probability and looking at the attributes of the antichrist you're saying that the antichrist is actually an individual at the moment but the ai could be a representative of that the 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 more nefarious side of ai is does it's that an make image sense? of the it's an image of the system mm, okay. that gives that antichrist his power right mm -hmm. the image of the beast now the beast is the g7 the 10 monarchies, it's basically the Western alliance is one of the beasts. The other beast is basically Russia, Iran, and China. And what it's exactly what we see today is two big giant sources of power playing off of each other. And to the point where we were, it could pose existential threats, right? Putin is constantly threatening nuclear, nuclear response in Ukraine if he doesn't win. If he doesn't win in Ukraine, if the if the former president wins in the election, he'll give Ukraine to Putin, right? If he loses, Putin's going to be desperate. Putin's going to be trying to find a way out. Uh, nuclear response is a possible response. And I believe that he'll start by trying to make it look like an accident by attacking the nuclear plant in, in Ukraine and basically sabotaging that and creating a um, Chernobyl uh, event out of that. But it also goes back to the Middle East, to the Saudi crown prince, uh, to the Muslim, uh, Islamic and Muslim prophecies about what they call the Dajjal and the Mahdi, which is their version of an Antichrist and a Messiah as well. Um, a lot of the, many people don't know, but the Hindu prophecies, Mayan prophecies, Hopi prophecies, all talk about a cycle of destruction. Uh, and in the, the course of humanity that we're in some cases like Maya and Hindi also talk about repeated cycles of destruction, uh, creation and destruction. Uh, and so there's a lot of when we look at the correlation factors between prophecies, even if we just if we expand it beyond just the Judeo Christian prophecies to extend to these other traditions, we also see a high correlation. So there's something certainly going on that's unique to this time, because I, I wanted to find out, are we living just in a very chaotic time of high transformation and high technology and uh, the society going through this upheaval to try and adjust to all these things? Or is there something truly prophetic about what we're experiencing? Mm. And based on the math, uh, I concluded it's prophetic. I believe it's prophetic as well. And, you know, part of why I love having these conversations is obviously learning more about the state of the world and, and what we can expect, but also kind of adding an element of, of hope and, and peace and kind of connecting to a higher power and whether or not someone believes in a higher power, whether they prefer to connect to nature or however they want to commune with the divine. I think more than ever, that's really important to kind of stay grounded, you know, um, because there's so much change happening. And I do think a lot of what's happening is intentional. And some might even say, oh, it's a test to humanity because some people have talked about uh, the lost uh, civilization of Atlantis 
And I don't know if you particularly have looked into that or you believe Atlantis existed, but a lot of people say that um, Atlantis was destroyed because they got um, obsessed with power, money, greed, and basically that they could not handle the technology or they got carried away with the power and, and the technology and basically destroyed their civilization. First off, I do believe that there was a, a that there was a um, more advanced civilization before the Mesopotamian civilization that got wiped out of history that we've forgotten largely uh, in part because the 13,000 years ago, the, when the younger Darius event happened, the asteroid hit North America, um, the oceans rose, a couple of things occurred. One is that it created this flash massive fire all across North America that burned everything to the ground. And there's a black mat in the geologic history that goes all the way down to South America. Uh, the second thing that happened is because of that, that melted the ice sheets that created the Missoula, that basically launched the Missoula flood that created the Portland uh, Channel uh, and, and flooded the oceans about uh, 40 feet almost overnight. And so most, as we, as today, most of our civilizations, big portion of civilization is by the coastline. So we had a massive loss of technology. Now, I don't think Atlantis was destroyed because they got too prideful with their technology. But what I think Plato was describing was the normal cycle of large civilizations that they get too powerful, they get too large, they get too powerful, and that power that turns into corruption, and that corruption basically becomes their um, um, destruction. And we saw it with the Persian and Mesopotamian Empire, we saw it with the Babylonian Empire, we saw it with the Persian Empire, we saw it with the Greek Empire, we saw it with the Roman Empire. And we're we're in danger of that with our current modern civilization as well. Uh, we've become our detachment between our actions and climate change, our actions and the good of humanity, because we've got this massive wealth distribution where 1% basically controls 60, 70% of the wealth of the planet. It's not sustainable, right? And every history has taught us that these things readjust often there's some something that basically becomes a trigger and then it readjusts through some sort of violent um, redistribution power. And so I believe that we're kind of nearing that transition. Now, one of the things that I developed in studying prophecy was that prophecy is less about how describing about how God's going to come and destroy the world as much as describing how our own hubris, pride and greed and sin will destroy us, will destroy ourselves. And that's what we're seeing, right? That's all of the things, all this, the attributes from the seven trumpets didn't happen because of an asteroid. They happened because of our own pollution, our own activities, um, the image of the beast, our own activities, the destructive power, the creation of these two global systems that are in conflict with each other. It's because we can't get along. And if you think about it, we have the technology, we have the financial resources, we have the natural resources, we have the human resources, we have the education to solve every single one of the problems facing humanity today, from homelessness to education, to jobs, to pollution, to access to water, to food. The only reason we don't is because, because of our tribalism, our pride, and our greed, and our hate. So we are the cancer within our own society. And unless that changes, we could create a utopia. So AI could help us create a utopia, but not before we go through a dystopia that would destroy some of these other systems before that technology would allow us to equalize the benefits of it to everyone. Mm -hmm. And um, we, so I think prophecy is really about how we will get better and better at our self-destructive tendencies until we actually good until we actually do it. And we are now at the first time in all of human history where we have between climate change, nuclear weapons, AI, viral weapons, uh, weaponizing viral um, viruses, often using AI to create those viruses. Uh, we are the first time in all of human history able to basically destroy the human race. Mm. That's never been possible before. It's just we could destroy a village, we could destroy a town, we could maybe take over a whole country, 
Uh, we could um, genocide, try and create a genocide for a single people. But to universally destroy ourselves at a planetary level is, again, I need probabilities. Uh, I have to go, I can't find any other example in all of human history where it wasn't that an asteroid had the potential of destroying humanity or a super volcano had the, had the potential where we had the potential ourselves. Mm. And that's a very scary part. Now, in my next book, the one I'm working on right now, um, you're right. Not everyone believes in prophecy. And I try to approach this in a very, I try to stay away from a lot of dogma and a lot of uh, doctrine for those reasons to try and just point out the correlations that are going on right now. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit lost my thought of where I was going to go there. Your book, the next book you're working on. Oh, yeah, on. yeah. I'm going to be dealing with this concept of, I'm also a scientist. I'm also a, I've also studied, in the, there's, a, there's a very logical part of my personality that doesn't just like to, that, that, I'm I'm never the if you ever find the guy in the whole crowd who won't drink the Kool Aid that's me, um, I'm like oh no I don't know I you know, what you're saying sounds good but not good enough I'm not drinking no Kool Aid for you, um, and so there's a part of me that won't drink the Kool Aid so I'm always looking for is there a rational is there a realistic is there a, is there a fact based explanation that I can put so I love the Lord but that means if the Lord created the universe. Studying how the universe works. Scientists studies how the universe works. And it's interesting because the, from science, we tend to study the what and the how. From faith, we really look at the who and the why. Right? Both are important. Both have to have believe in things that they can't quite prove yet. But they somehow believe that they exist. And there's a correlation. There's an overlap between those two systems. Science believes, if you look at the studies of physics, believes that there's lots of evidence and the mathematics prove it. And so a lot of the experimentation indicates it should exist, that there should be more than the dimensions that we can put our hand, that we can see and perceive to the universe. That the universe exists beyond what we can see and perceive, not only in terms of wavelengths of light, in terms of sound waves, things that you know we need instruments to detect, but in dimensionality. So all of the physics theories ultimately conclude that there's string theory believes that there's as many um, uh, 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 other theories predict that there's eight. Um, sci uh, Einstein even predicted there's at least one. Um, so all of these theories, uh, quantum theory predicts uh, multiple dimensions as well. Every level of physics ultimately gets back to this thing that we can't prove yet that there's more than higher dimension. Well. In a, in a scientific perspective, that might be the fifth dimension or an N4 plus dimension. To a person of faith, that might be, okay, well, that's heaven, right? That produces, that justifies, that validates the belief in paranormal. And if I include spirituality within that sense, of that larger scope of paranormal, the sense that there's something happening here that I can't quite put my finger on. We seem to be sharing some of the same space time, but we're not sharing some of the same dimensions where I can perceive that person or what's really going on. But there's um, certainly videos of paranormal activities of basically um, poltergeists being active in, in a situation. We have visions, we have prophecies, we have dreams, and there's so much correlation to the these things there's so much validity to these things that we can't discount them as completely fictitious or uh, um, fictional and so scientists is looking at these things and actually CERN is actually trying to do experiments called the atlas experiment and in these atlas experiments and I, I and I involve I include this in my book they're trying to create a mini black hole and then track a gravity particle going into that black hole and it sh should produce certain results I won't go into the details but essentially would prove a fifth dimension and CERN's been working on this experiment for a number of years and there's there's a quantum nature to that um, that experiment that they haven't quite figured out yet and they haven't succeeded yet but what I'm trying to say and the long way of saying it is that science is saying that there should be a there should be an explanation for what faith is saying we believe science calls it theories and hypothesis right I hypothesize that this exists and that exists and therefore if I can do this kind of test maybe I can prove that hypothesis 
people of religions call it faith. But they're really the same fundamental thing. Now, faith itself is a quantum experience. It's the ability to believe something I can't see and to believe more than one multiple possibilities can exist at once. Uh, and that's really a quantum level experience. The ability to communicate signals between there's a, and there's one of the principles of quantum uh, theory is that what we call entanglement that something that happens to a particle in one dimension could affect another particle in another dimension that's entangled, even though through great distances. And so we see this and we've proven this through scientific uh, experiments and even with our own dimension, and we believe that that exists within multiple dimensions as well. So science is saying, is proving in a lot of ways, the framework, the what and the how of the, the, the how the universe works and looks in such a way that it's consistent with how many religions believe the world looks and they call it spiritual as, as opposed to dimension. And so we, we're looking at it from different perspectives and we're using different terminologies and we're using different ways of thinking about it. But one is looking at the how and the what and the other one is looking at the who and the why. We wanna know about the relationship. We wanna know about the, why did you create it this way? Why did you create us this way? What, how are we supposed to react to each other? So we're looking at the who and the why on one side, the what and the how on the other side, but we're still trying to approach and study the same thing fascinating and I love love that and that's why I love having these conversations because I am a big believer that we're all kind of saying the same thing we're all kind of chasing the same answer to the same question fundamentally but we all have different ways of kind of getting to that answer or visualizing it or explaining it so you've given us so much to talk about this was a great conversation guy and I'm sure I'm going to have you back on the podcast to even go I much like much deeper because I know we can if it was up to us, we'd probably be talking for like another three hours. But before I let you go and before I ask you where people can find you, I have to ask, because it's shifting dimensions, have you shifted in perspective on anything lately? And it could be as lighthearted as you recently discovered that you like chocolate ice cream or however deep you want it to be. Most of my, my life, I've been the mad scientist. I'm the guy who basically isolates by himself and creates something weird. And, and, and I'm really horrible at interacting with many people. Um, I'm going to actually give this question in two answers. Um, one is I've learned that I'm actually enjoying for a long time all I had to talk about was my job. And, and not many people were interested in all the geeky, weird things I could do. Now that I'm an author and I have books to talk about and the research into those books and the things I'm learning and discovering, I'm enjoying interacting with people. I go out and do book signings all the time. And I found that one of the most, even though it's hard work, the thing that I enjoy the most is the ability to engage with readers, similar to how we're engaging where I can talk about the principles that were the real principles that went into my fictional stories. And that's become a real big joy for me that the, the learning that I can interact with other people and find a common ground is something new for me because I was a bit of a loner uh, a lot of my life. And in part because I was a single parent and working 80 plus hours a week and I just didn't have time to be much of a social person. I'm just not, it, that's never my strength. The other thing that I think that is, I've changed on recently that affects, I think, everyone. I was an economist. So I, I was an economist and I was coming out of college. I was really growing in my skill sets at the time when the Reaganomics theories of trickle down were really becoming popular in the mindset. And frankly, there was a positive, there was, there's a certain level of that that was trying not to be deceptive, that was thinking, okay, this, this really could be an engine for us, that if we, uh, if we empowered this one sector of society, we could basically get more benefits in the other sector of society. The problem is, is that the facts haven't shown up that way. That's not what the experience has shown. That's not what the data has shown. And so I've come to readjust my idea that that trickle down economics works. And, and what I've reinforced is that greed is a far more powerful motivation than I ever gave it credit for with my idealistic days in college. And what we've seen since that economics is that trigonomic or trickle down economics is a continuing decrease of the uh, taxes that corporations and wealthy have to pay, the, the increase in the things that they can get away with, the lowering of accountability controls, such as people in the IRS who could actually keep them accountable, and a huge distribution of wealth during that same time frame. 
Um, and we've seen our country go from, we've seen things like Citizens United where they have as much power as a citizen to control things. We've gotten more money influence into politics. So what I've seen is that the data from that did not live up to the promise. It's not a valid concern. Greed will overcome. And we've seen stock buybacks and stock employment um, for executives for the money they weren't paying in taxes went to the executive. It didn't go to the employees. It didn't go to new programs. It didn't go into wage hikes. Average wage hikes in the enterprise has gone up maybe 20, 30%. Average wage hikes for the executive have gone up 500%. And so what we've seen is that it was an engine for greed. And so I've, as an economist, uh, one of the things we have to do is, yeah, we can develop theories, we can build models on those theories, we can believe in those theories, but when data doesn't support the theory, you have to rewrite the theory. Thank you for sharing that. Um, where can people find you guys if they want to connect with you, get some of your books, or just listen to more podcasts that you featured on? Um, GuyMorrisBooks.com. Um, that's a good place to start. There's uh, links to buy links. There's uh, trailers for the books. There's highlights to some of the major industry reviewers. I've been compared to Dan Brown, Robert Ludlum, Myers Johansson, and others, uh, Tom Clancy. Uh, you can find fact versus fiction pages for my books. So there's so much fact and put into my books that I publish. And I tell people, read it after you read the book. But, you know, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. This may be only folklore and um, I can't prove it. And now I made this part up. So I, I want to then be transparent with people about the part because my books are fictional, but include so much factual information behind the fiction. I think it's important for people to know just how much of the story is based on real, real things. Uh, there's I have a press kit there. I have a press kit demo reel. So there's that's a really great place to start. And if you want to buy the book and get a signed copy, you can buy it directly from the site. Awesome. I'm going to put the link to your website in the show notes. Thank you again, Guy, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions.